Welcome back to Trip Talk Tech. We got a super dope, super informative show for you guys today. We're going to be talking youth athletics, sports parents, and the psychology of it all. With our honor to guest today, please help me welcome author, esteemed author, uh, the mental preparation trainer and sports psychologist for the Baltimore Orioles, former sports psychologist for the Super Bowl champion Baltimore Ravens. Please help me welcome to the show, Dr. David McDuff. How you doing today, sir? All is well. Spring is coming. <laughs> yeah, it is. The lockout's over, so I guess you're about to get back to work, huh? 99 days, no. I mean, they went back to spring training fast. Oh, they were back in, huh? The minor leaguers were already down there, so uh, yeah, our group had gone down as we've done every year for the past 27 seasons, and then they turned right around and went back again for the 40-man roster players. Man, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, first of all, we'd like to just thank you for your time. Um, obviously, with being with the Orioles and probably a bunch of other kids, you, you got a lot to do. So, we do thank you for taking your time um, here at Trip Talk Tech. Uh, we really go after the, the game changers. We go after the disruptors in, in the fields. And what kind of category I put you in um, is actually life-changing, right? Um, Definitely within the mental health space, you're guiding young men and, and, and athletes, not just young men, young women as well, but athletes in general, uh, to their better selves. And um, I think when we look at athletes, we always look at them from a performance standpoint, right? Hey, they did great today, that's my guy, or that's my girl, or they did horrible, I can't stand them, right? Yeah. And, and, and I think we, you know, us as parents, you know, we have to deal with the kids that, to, to deal with these up and down, you know, emotions. But I'm sure as the athlete, you know, they have to deal with that. And, and when I went and started researching you, um, your website, MarylandSports.MDSports.net, uh, um, I saw a bunch of resources there for free. Yes. That parents can go out, please check it out if you haven't. Uh, but they can go out there, they can see, um, it, no matter the sport too, you got some stuff for basketball, football, swimming, lacrosse, everything, free resources to just help an athlete, some mantras they can get up and say, some things they can uh, do for themselves to keep their mental health. For all that, we say thank you. Uh, for the parents that don't know it's out there, for the athletes that don't know it out, is out there, please check it out, mdsports.net. Um, right. And just salute to you for that. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah, really? definitely, definitely. Appreciate you inviting me. This is a, a passion I've had for a lot of years I grew up in Alabama mm -hmm. as a University of Alabama football game it's one of the okay. few things we rank high in <laughs> a lot of things that the state ranks low in but I uh, captured a passion for competitive sports way back then mm -hmm. I was a bowler and a distance runner myself wow. Wow. Uh, but as the years rolled along and I had kids they all became interested in soccer, so mm -hmm. they all four played soccer in high school. Two of them went on and played soccer in college. Wow. Uh, and had a, uh, my middle daughter went and uh, ran distance at University of Virginia. So oh, okay. uh, I've been through it as a parent. I coached uh -huh. them in basketball and soccer. Okay, and, okay. Yeah, I always tried to make sure that they had one sport that they played for fun mm -hmm. and another sport that they play you know in a more serious way and That's i think that you know not having something too early that you compete in year round there are a lot of forces out there that send 10 year olds 11 year olds 12 year olds into year round competition mm -hmm. in one sport and their bodies aren't really ready for that yeah, you know, they run into overuse injuries. Mm -hmm. They get burned out. You know, at way too early an age, wow. uh, and so try to help parents be realistic. You know about how much time they dedicate to their sport. Now, there are certain sports which do start earlier and get serious earlier, like swimming and gymnastics. Those two sports, along with figure skating have 25 to 30 practice hours a week wow. then you add in school it doesn't leave much time for family friends or fun 
Uh, and so if you don't have a little fun in your life, if you're not enjoying your sport, you're on the road to burnout. And we don't want to see that happen. Hey man, uh, you, you bring some, some great points up that I, I know we're going to touch today. I, I, um, like I was telling you earlier before we got going, um, this, this topic is a personal one for me as well. Just like you said, uh, uh, I have kids and I do, I have a kid that I've been on that division one sports journey. And, and like you said, I think the difficulty is finding that balance, right? The, the family balance versus the sport versus am I playing this sport too much in the year long, too early. I mean, you, you made some great points in that and we're definitely going to touch that. And, and again, that's why I'm so geeked today because we get to, we, we get to kind of work through these things. Um, I get to be the ambassador probably for the other parents that are out there, again, doing exactly that same thing we both did. When you have kids, you want to keep them involved in something. They say they have an interest somewhere, but then you, know, you don't want to burn them out. And that actually takes me to a, a, if I'm being transparent, it takes me to a story me and, me and my son had. You know, we, again, he division one basketball player. He, he graduated, you know, got his degree on time. And uh, it, on graduation day, he, he walked me out into the, 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 the stadium, their football stadium. And he has a man to man talk with me to let me know, you know, at graduation time, he was done with basketball. And, um, you know, I took the big swallow and said, okay, son, and, 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 you know, let him talk his spiel. But I think at the end, you know, I, I walking away, I just asked him, hey, look, do you mind telling me, you know, you know why, why did you stop? You know, and his thing was, he was burnt out, just like you just said. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, I think it was, he felt like he made a lot of sacrifices. You know, he, he had to miss some, you know, parties. He had to miss some things that all his friends got to go to in high school that he never really got a chance to engage yeah. in um, because he was with the sport. And I think for me, I understood. I definitely would support the next move, but for the kids behind him, for the kids I still might coach and for the other ones, you know, I was in a confused state, right? I, I didn't know. It was like, what was too much? You know, I, I have this kid that says he wants this dream and he actually got the dream. You know, we wouldn't even get the burnout if we didn't get to the dream. True. So it, it's like, you know, now the next kid. And they want to, oh, well, I want to go to college, but I want to do this. And now it's like, what's too much? You know, how can we, and I think you mentioned it in, in your opening, but uh, and we can circle back. But how can we as parents keep the, the sport fun or keep the activities fun? when our kids still have these aspirations to be this player yeah several things that you can do is when they're young mm -hmm. when they're four to eight is it's all about being physically active it's okay. not trying to find a sport to become competitive to be the best in that sport okay. is developing a natural joy for movement and you know, participating with others and, you know, physical fitness and seeing how that's going to fit into your life, you know, for the years to come. Mm -hmm. And then exposing your child to a number of different sports. You, you know, most parents have a sport or two that they either played or mm -hmm. they like, and they're likely to go straight to those sports or that's played more in their community. Uh, but it really can pay off to let them get exposed to sports that they may not have a natural interest in, may not know much about. And you just let them try different sports and you'll be surprised. You know, my uh, oldest daughter was a soccer player and her brother, who was one year older, uh, he was also a serious soccer player. They played on club teams when they were you know, coming up through middle school and high school. And just to stay fit for soccer, he started running track. Well, she did what her older brother did, mm -hmm. and she found out she was really good at distance running. Okay. And so she might never have discovered that, that she could run distance fast. Uh, and she crossed over to that sport, kind of left soccer behind, and. You know, that led her to, to college in that sport. Uh, she later discovered 
she told me one day, she said, Dad, she said, no. She said, I never really enjoyed running like most of my college teammates. She said, I was just good at it. Hmm. So it's something to keep in mind. You want to have that balance between being good at something and enjoying it naturally. Because if you study high achieving athletes, mm -hmm. they report that they enjoy practice and competition. They just can't quite get enough of it. That is until they get to college <laughs> and they have to wake up at six o'clock and lift weights, then go to class, yeah. then go to practice and they're two hours and they're full of intensity. Mm -hmm. And then you shoot free throws at the end and if you miss one Back or two, the whole team is running you know, yeah, court sprints. Exactly. Uh, and then you're exhausted, you go eat a meal, and you've got, you know, book studying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can, and then also be careful about how quickly you get them to the highest competitive level. You know, Expand can, on it, that a little bit. It can please. be a mistake, you know, if you look in this area for basketball, Everyone knows that if you want to play on a premier AAU team, you go to D.C. Yep. Uh, and so parents then start to find the top teams, drive their child an hour, an hour and a half, one way yeah, in D.C. traffic. You know, and there's a time and a place to shift to the highest competitive level because you think that gives you an advantage in achieving your dream. but it could be too early depending on the emotional maturity of you know, your son or your daughter because mm -hmm. some of them need to stay a little bit more connected with their neighborhood, with their school, with you know, outside of school activities and not be dedicating you know, 25 hours a week including commuting time to practice and then going away. I had a a high school tennis player who I worked with one year. It was his senior year. He'd already been accepted to his number one college, was going to play tennis there. And I just kind of casually, I said, what are you going to do this summer? He goes, well, I guess I'm going to play tennis. I said, you don't sound real thrilled about that. He said, well, really I'm not. I said, well, what would you rather do? He said, I'd rather write and hang out with my friends. I said, you write? He goes, yeah, he said, I had this eighth grade English teacher who just encouraged me to write. I wrote an essay one day and she said, this is really good. You're really good at this. Wow. And he said, I stayed in touch with her and she just kept encouraging me. He said, but I never had time for it. I was always competing to get my ranking up. Yep, yep, I was yep. going away on weekends. I never saw my friends. So I said, hmm. Maybe you should stay home and write this summer and not play tennis. So he took a break. Mm -hmm. It refreshed his spirit, you know, for his sport. And he went on and played four years in college and found his major and thrived there. But I suspect he would have probably quit his first year had he not taken that break and put some balance back in his life. Wow, wow. Kind of going on that point, like you're saying, we, we should be able to tell that difference. Are there any telltale signs kind of when that kid is getting to that burned out mode or, hey, maybe I'm taking this nine-year-old and I'm pushing him a little too hard, you know, right now at this point? If you look for how they react to what's happening in practice and in games, and if they start to carry, you know, discouragement or self-doubt or frustration. If you see them come off the court and they're hanging their head down and they're filled with negative emotions, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the way a practice ought to be. Yes, they're intense because coaches want to try to replicate the intensity in practice that they're going to face in a game. You know, Coach K, who's retiring, that Duke is known for running really intense practices. But there is a way to coach up someone with intensity where it's still, you enjoy competition. You, you, you hone in on getting better. 
But if they're coming home for every practice just discouraged, I'm not getting better, I'm getting worse, there's negative talk, and you see them you know, with those negative emotions in their face, yeah. that's time to take a little break and figure out what's going on and seeing if you know it's too much too early uh, because one sport specialization was and still is a trend Yes, where definitely. by age 10, 11, 12. They locked in. Yeah. But you know, in other countries that are older than the United States who kind of appreciate that you don't have to be in a hurry to get to you know, your dream, to your, to your higher competitive levels. You need to keep life balanced so that you keep you know, one foot in sport, one foot in academics, you know, one in family, friends, and I always ask athletes that I meet with, what do you do for fun? And too many of them will just, like, they got nothing to say because they've given up their fun. You know, I worked with two sisters, figure skaters, who were both in high school, who woke up at five o'clock every morning, drove an hour and a half for their morning skating session, mm -hmm got back in the car, the mom has taken them all these places, back to school for a four hour school day, shortened, mm -hmm. then back in the car, back down to Northern Virginia for another two hour skating session. And they did that seven days a week oh. when I met them. And both of them were right at the very edge of just, Get you know, sending their skates out the know, window yeah, out, out the window <laughs> and i asked the the older of the two who was an 11th grader when i met her i said what do you do for fun she said i haven't even been to the mall she said i don't get to hang out with any of my friends i mm -hmm. said is that something you'd like to do she said yes i said well i'll talk to your mom and it took me three months of negotiating Negotiate. And it was a negotiation because I'm not sure if you've heard of the term Tiger Mom. Yeah, there was a definitely. book written. It's, it's the type of parent who has a dream for their child, Ooh. not allowing their child's the dream, dream to, Man, you know, to just grow from within. Mm -hmm. And they push and push and push. And she thought her two daughters were going to achieve by That's being great. pushed by a really tough coach who happened to be 90 miles away, who had a real strong mistake-based approach. No, that's not how we do it. There was a book written by the, the head coach of the U.S. women's national soccer team back in the Mia Hamm era. And when he first started, you know, he kind of grew up coaching guys and he got out there and he started blowing his whistle and shouting and yelling, no, no, that's not what we talked handle. about. And he started to notice that they just shut down. So he called this woman he knew, whose name is Colleen Hatcher, his name was Tony DeChico. Mm -hmm. And he said, Colleen, he said, I've only been here a week. And he said, I'm shutting this team down. They won't play for me. He said, I need you to come here and help me. And she said, I'm really busy, Tony. I, I can't okay. come out there now. She was in Portland, Oregon. Okay. He was on the East Coast. So finally he you know, talked her into coming and she went out to the first practice and she watched about 15 minutes. She blew the whistle and said, ladies, take a break. And she said, Tony, you and I need to talk. She said, you are way too negative. You only blow the whistle when something bad happens. That's why they're shutting down. So see, you have to change and start blowing the whistle when they do something well. So they wrote a book together called Catch Them Being Good. And I read that book when my kids were probably 10 to 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And I had started to notice the, the higher the level of competition in terms of their club soccer teams, the more negative the talk was on the sidelines by the parents. So I committed myself to try to change that. Mm. 
And at first I was the only voice when something positive happened. I said, yeah, that's it. You know, beautiful. I, I, I do the same thing. Parents yeah. turned to me and said, What's but they wrong? didn't score. I said, but did you see that sequence of passes? Beautiful. <laughs> and so the next thing you know, over time, some of the moms started joining in. Mm. And then more of the moms and then a few of the dads. And it took about three months, you know, most of a season, mm -hmm. but they finally changed into noticing and their children started telling them, you know, I like it that you're, you know, yeah. you're, you're finding positive yeah. moments in our play instead of the groans that were coming from Wrong before. <laughs> so you try to be positive with your child. A lot of children do not want to talk about the game as soon as the game is over. All right, now that's a good point right there because I think I'm victim to that one, Doc, right? Uh, <laughs> and I actually had this down. So if I'm being honest, that car ride home probably isn't the best. You know, as a parent, you, you try to hold up, right? You, you, I, I know they're probably not feeling good right now, yeah. but it's like, I don't want to lose what just happened so they know. Like, when is the best time for that conversation? Usually your child will will tell you you know if, if you just have an open conversation with them you know you know i i'm into sports i like to watch you play mm -hmm. yeah i know a little bit about the game too i've coached it or i've played it uh when's the best time for us to have a review of your game i'm gonna give you a folder that has a little one page sheet in it that I ask every athlete that I work with to fill out okay. before they go to bed. Okay. Up at the top it says my goals and the goals could be for one game or for a season and I try to get them not to focus on results, mm -hmm. not outcome goals, but on how they want to play. So let's say in basketball. Okay. I want to play with full defensive intensity. Okay. I said, boy, I can. I know what that looks like. I've seen it on a court. Uh -huh. Yeah. And if you play with full defensive intensity, what are the outcomes likely to be? So it takes a little while to come up with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To play with full focus and intensity, or to play relaxed but focused. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so once they craft that, then it just says, what was the event? You know, what date? What were the results? Mm -hmm. But then generally how I felt as the competition was beginning. Positive thoughts and emotions, how they helped me during the competition. Negative thoughts and emotions, how they got in my way and what I did to try to prevent them from interfering. And then very bottom, three things to work on before the next practice. And so I just had a baseball player, college baseball player, send me 12 sheets. He, he should have been sending three for each of the last four weekends, but he never got around to doing it. So he said he had a day off, which was Tuesday, and he finished all 12 of them. And then I like to meet back and go over those. So once they've had a chance to do that review by themselves, mm -hmm. if you can try to you know, get them to commit to getting better at something each practice, doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. If you get better at something over here, it'll help you get better at something over here and something over here and something over here. So I always start a season by saying, what would you like to see yourself get better at this season? So if it's basketball, you know, how would you like to get better defensively, offensively, and in transition? You know, so every sport has it's different elements yeah. to it. And then once they can state that mm -hmm. in process terms, then I want to have those positive thoughts and emotions rise up and be dominant but I also want them to learn how when they get into a tough period of play, how to fight through that negativity and be able to reset and just come back strong because every competition, you know, sport or non-sport, you're gonna run into a brick wall from yeah. time to time. Definitely.